Hello, and thank you very much for attending. Thank you to the program uh, committee for inviting me. Um, I do have uh, one disclosure today that should not affect the contents of this study. So when we talk about postoperative complications, the first thing we need to know is what is normal. So here's a patient that has an epidural hematoma, and we can see they're running into trouble. They have significant uh, midline shift. They also have some transcentorial herniation. And so they had this hematoma evacuated. And normally what we see after evacuation is a um, resection site that has some hyperdense blood products or proteinaceous material and some gas. But importantly, we, know, we notice that the midline shift is significantly improved and the herniation has uh, essentially resolved. So this is all expected change. Here's another case. This is, in this case, we have a subdural hematoma. Again, there's some midline shift. There's some uncle herniation. The basilar cisterns are somewhat effaced. And notice also in this case, we have uh, some ventricular uh, enlargement on the contralateral side, so we know that there's some entrapment. So this patient was taken urgently to OR, and the subdural was evacuated. And again, we see the similar appearance of extraaxial blood products and gas at the resection site. Um, we notice that there is uh, still some midline shift, but the uncle herniation has definitely improved. There's more space around the brainstem. And it's just a finding that with these subdural hematomas, the brain tends not to bounce back as quickly. This is particularly true if the subdural is uh, chronic or if the patient has volume loss. So we do want to definitely look at our mass effect, but we have to remember that subdural brains just act differently than epidural brains. Our next case is a patient who had uh, blunt cerebral vascular injury. His initial head CT was negative. Um, he got a CTA, and we see this very nice or uh, very good example of uh, intraluminal thrombus. That was a sequela of a dissection. And unfortunately, he went on to develop a large infarct. So we knew this gentleman was at risk for mass effect, and indeed his mass effect worsened to the point where he started to have uh, mental status decline and he underwent a decompressive hemicraniectomy. And as we assess this, we can see that we have a really nice, large uh, craniectomy defect here to give the brain lots of room, um, but we notice that there's still significant midline shift. And uh, it's common to see small hemorrhages at the margin of the uh, craniectomy defect. I would not say that's a complication as long as there's no mass effect related to that. That's a common finding. But as we look at this patient over time, we can see as we march through, he really had a rocky course and had a lot of head CTs. But notice this temporal horn of the left lateral ventricle, the contralateral side. Okay, so it's increased in size a little bit, increased again, increased again. And if we made the mistake of just comparing the most recent prior, we might not notice this progressive inexorable developing hydrocephalus here. So we must look at the trend over time and go back and look at an early study. Um, and developing hydrocephalus, since we're mostly focusing on the area where the infarct is, is something that we don't want to miss. Uh, and unfortunately, despite the, the very good decompression, uh, the patient just continued to have mass effect and the family opted to not to have any further intervention. Here's a different um, case of a patient with a decompressive craniectomy, and we see that um, there's midline shift here, but the shift is going in the wrong direction, right? Why is there right to left midline shift after this right decompressive craniectomy? Well, in this case, we can see the brain is pretty slack in the neurosurgical terms. There's no mass effect here, and this is a common normal finding. Um, of brain sag that we see after decompressive hemicraniectomy. And as long as there's no mass effect, it's not something to worry about. So when we're looking at patients who are after a craniectomy, we want to, on the first postoperative study, say, OK, is there adequate decompression? Is the bone flap big enough? Uh, in the setting of trauma, once you release that uh, pressure, you can see blossoming contusions or contralateral subdural hematomas develop, so you want to examine for those. Developing hydrocephalus, we are always thinking about that. And sometimes uh, that developing hydrocephalus can be external hydrocephalus, where you see a collection developing under that craniectomy flap. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And then late, we're going to think about infection. <laughs> 
So here's a patient who had an acute subdural hematoma. It was evacuated, looks great. She presented one month later and had some headaches. And we see that there is a continued collection. That's not unusual for one month after a subdural hematoma. You can have these cavities remaining. But what is unusual, and what's the red flag here, is that there's vasogenic edema in that uh, um, underlying brain. So that is a red flag that we have to take very seriously, and we need to consider whether there's an infection. So the patient underwent contrast-enhanced MRI. Now we see enhancement at the, around the residual subdural collection. Hard to know what to make of that, really, because it, the brain does demonstrate some enhancement after subdurals. But again, we see that vasogenic edema. Now, in this case, there was no developing abscess. We would expect to see a bright DWI um, collection here within the vasogenic edema. And although we were very concerned about infection, clinically the patient was not acting infected at all. So they watched her carefully, and three more weeks uh, later, they, she presented back with another head CT. And now we can see that vasogenic edema is worse, uh, confirmed on MRI. Still no abscess, but the progressive uh, dural thickening and enhancement in vasogenic edema really is concerning for uh, infection. And they took her back to surgery, and there was indeed pus in this subdural collection. So uh, if you see a new parenchymal edema after an extraaxial uh, hematoma resection, you have to think about abscess. And um, I guess we'll just move on. OK. Sorry, there's a little delay between the mouse and the response here. So um, if we do see that progressive uh, edema after a tumor resection, it might be abscess, but it may also be uh, just tumor progression. This will eventually uh, catch up with my trigger finger, and then we'll move on. Um, now, my next case shows a patient who had a epidural hematoma that was evacuated about one year um, prior to presenting with drainage from the wound. So if we look at this case, the first thing we notice is, gosh, there's still something there in the extraaxial space. But you know, it's um, isoattenuating or slightly hyperattenuating to brains, so that's not typical for a subacute hematoma. And if we look at the bone flap, we can see that the bone flap has this moth-eaten, eroded look. So this turned out to be uh, an infected craniectomy uh, flap, craniotomy flap, and a subdural empyema. So as I mentioned, epidural hematomas usually don't hang around. Once you evacuate them, the cavity usually um, resolves completely. Subdurals could hang around, but if this were a subdural that was a year old, we would expect that to be low density, not iso to slightly hyperdense. And that bone flap is clearly abnormal. So those are the clues. So now let's talk about post-op resections. And in the ED, you might be asked to read these post-op films if the case ends up late at night. So this is a person who had a glioblastoma that was resected and presented back with this mass. They weren't sure if it was glioblastoma or radiation necrosis, so they decided to take it out. And what we see on this initial post-operative CT is that there's some pneumocephalus here. We see the resection cavity. We see gas in the resection cavity and a little bit of hyperdense material along the surface of the brain, blood products, surge cell, you know, hemostatic material, all within normal limits. This is what the resection cavity should look like. Here's another glioblastoma that was resected. And in this case, again, we see that pneumocephalus. That's fine. We see an extraaxial collection containing some fluid and gas. That's fine. But really, there's a little bit more um, blood in that resection cavity than we normally see. Now, this isn't frankly abnormal at this point. I would say we need to watch this carefully. It's more than we typically see, but there's not a lot of mass effect on there. Uh, so the patient did uh, undergo a follow-up exam, and uh, about a week later, that hematoma had resolved. But clearly in this patient, there was something uh, going on, a propensity toward bleeding in that glioblastoma because he presented, uh, unfortunately, a week later with another hemorrhage. <laughs> 
Now here's a patient who had a, a frontal meningioma with a lot of vasogengedema. This was resected. And when you resect a meningioma like this, it's a very large scalp incision, a coronal incision extending ear to ear over the top of the head. You have a large bone uh, skull flap that's uh, pulled anteriorly. And on our post-operative film, we see that there's pneumocephalus here, and there's a fairly um, extensive subgaleal collection containing gas. This is normal. It's normal to have fluid and gas after a skin flap of that size. Um, but uh, the patient presented back early because they continued to have a fluctuant infection, or excuse me, collection underneath the skin flap, and an MRI was obtained that showed these bilateral collections that were enhancing. The question is, what do you do with this, right? You can see a lot of enhancement with granulation tissue, but in this case, the DWI was very helpful because we see these collections are bright on DWI with ADC signal dropout, and that tilts us toward um, thinking that these are infected collections. And indeed, when they took the patient back for a washout, this was pus. Uh, here's another uh, glioblastoma. Uh, the patient was taken to OR for resection of this. And the post-operative MRI shows uh, that there's some inherently uh, T1 hyperintense material at the resection cavity, just a little bit of enhancement, but there is some Periresectional ischemia is the terminology I use. Um, you can see this to variable degrees depending on how aggressive they're being with trying to take the tumor out. And again, I would not necessarily call this a complication, um, but this patient came back 10 weeks later with drainage from the wound, and you can see that there is still soft tissue thickening over that craniectomy, craniotomy flap. So the patient had an MRI scan, and this area of the brain underneath the, the bone flap is enhancing. We want to know, gosh, is this tumor, infection, infarct? But remember, that's where that area of restricted diffusion was. So in this case, this is just subacute infarct. However, we're not off the hook here because we see there's layering debris in the ventricles, and that layering debris is bright on DWI and dark on ADC. So in addition to their subacute infarct, they have ventriculitis, and they found pus in the ventricles. Let's briefly talk about some spinal emergencies. This patient presented with acute back pain after surgery. We're all looking at all this hardware and groaning, but as we look carefully, we can see there's inner body grafts here, 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 but what is going on with this inner body graft? So the first thing we need to do is say, well, what did it look like immediately after surgery? And we can see that the inner body graft was in expected position. So this is just graft migration. The key with these spine surgery patients, there's any number of things that can happen. Go back to the first post-operative radiograph and compare them. That's gonna be your best bet. These complications can develop over time and be difficult to find if you're just comparing the one month prior study. Here's another patient that came in with back pain after a fusion, and we say, gosh, this does not look very good. There's junctional kyphosis here. We look back at the first study and we see that that has developed. It's a six, weeks, uh, six week interval. So the patient went to get a CT scan and we see all the hardware, but you know, there is a big change in alignment here, and the patient has had no intervention between this radiograph and the CT, so we know this spine is very unstable. It's moving all over the place. And with, when we look at those CT images, we can see why. There's a fracture line involving the vertebral body extending along the pedicle and involving the pars interarticularis, and it involves the pedicle and pars on both sides. So this is a very unstable fracture. Um, here is a patient who presented with a myxopapillary ependymoma. It was resected. Uh, Postoperatively, they had pain and neurologic deficits. And when we get the MRI, there's a lot going on here. It's very confusing. But let's focus down to see that there is a big laminectomy defect and there's some material in that defect. When we look at the, um, the conus, that looks fine, but the nerve roots are kind of squished together. Uh, so when we look on our post contrast, uh, this is an ugly appearing resection, however, this is completely normal. We always see a little bit of enhancement around those early postoperative sites, and in fact, that enhancement can be a lot more florid than this. But when we look at the uh, material extending from the resection cavity into the epidural space, we can see that it's um, compressing the thecal sac, uh, and that um, is causing thecal compression. So this patient was taken back to OR urgently, and this was all epidural hematoma that was having mass effect. <laughs> 
My final case here uh, involves a person who had a gastrointestinal um, surgery and had an epidural catheter for pain control. Now, they had trouble with this. They placed it a couple times. They got CSF once or twice, but they eventually got pain control for this. She woke up the next day, and they called a stroke code because she wasn't moving her legs and was, uh, had mental status changes. And of course, you're all screaming at me, hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus. Yes, that's our first thing. We pick up the phone as we look at the study closer and we see the intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, she went, underwent an MRI because we were concerned about an epidural hematoma. The brain part shows us the acute hydrocephalus, but it also shows us that incomplete flare suppression in the subarachnoid spaces, so we know there's subarachnoid hemorrhage. The spine MRI shows that there was indeed something that happened to the spinal cord at this level. We can see the cord signal abnormality. But luckily, there was no large epidural hematoma. We see normal epidural fat. But you know, something is wrong with the T2 signal in the CSF. It's just not as bright as what we would expect it to be. And as we look at the cervical spine, again, we can see that T1 signal, the T2 signal in the CSF is not as bright as we would expect, and the T1 signal is also abnormal as compared to what we would normally see here. And this was extensive subarachnoid hemorrhage. So um, in summary, when we look at intracranial uh, infections, we want to think about mass effect. We want to think about hydrocephalus and infection. And the spine MRI is key for evaluation. Contrast often doesn't help, but we often get it um, because of there can be extensive enhancing granulation tissue. And then epidural hematomas are very tricky, but if you see mass effect on the thecal sac, you have to think about epidural hematoma as the possible cause. And with that, I thank you very much.